Hello YouTube, I'm Andrew Does Hair. You can find my work on Instagram at Andrew Does Hair. Today I want to talk about, man, I don't even know how to describe this, kind of the marketplace of haircuts. Essentially what makes one haircut more expensive than another and so many things attached to that, like what will make you love going to work every day versus feeling like it's work. And the things that kind of separate, like why are some haircuts $20 and they can look great? And why are some haircuts $100 and they can look okay? Hopefully like overall, just to kind of give barbers and stylists who are trying to grow a roadmap to more effectively grow and stop spinning their wheels. Because I have to admit, this is an industry that is very easy to get into and work your ass off and feel like you're not getting anywhere. But I feel like if you understand this stuff that I'm gonna lay out here, it makes it a lot easier to kind of grab a hold of the rudder on the back of your boat and get it going in the direction you wanna go. Here's the thing about the hair industry that is kind of baffling. In some sense, we know the score. We can look at the people and see, oh, they have followings, and, or we can see who's fully booked, we can see who's busy all the time, we can see who's like winning, right? We can see people who are very busy with hair. And we can agree, like, okay, that, that the score is that guy's doing really well. But what we can't seem to understand is the rules. You know, in a sport of sorts, basketball, for example, I guess is a sport, we know the rules and based on the rules, we can point at who is the best at the game. But with hair, we can kind of generally understand who's doing really well, but we don't know, what, we don't understand the rules. What I wanna break down today is kind of my understanding of the rules and how it's shaped my career in hopes that it can help you to shape your own career in the way that you would like. Now this is content that was included in my thehairjam.com course, but that came out like four years ago now, it's pretty old. And so I always planned on someday eventually repurposing the content. And so that's what I'm doing here today. Um, we haven't really had any traffic on the hair jam recently. And so I feel kind of okay putting this older stuff here on YouTube for free now. And new stuff is going to come to the hair jam as we pick that up again. But going back to understanding the score and not the rules, I feel like there's this general idea, if you just talk to, like I talk to a lot of barbers and a lot of hairstylists, that's like what I do for a living. And there's this general idea that, you know, there's maybe some kind of graph or chart this way, where at the beginning, you know, you're new at cutting hair and eventually you get really good at cutting hair. And so there's this like idea of a scale of talent and how good you are at cutting hair. And then the assumption is, oh, when you're new, your haircuts aren't worth all that much. But when you get really, really good, your haircuts become worth more. And it's like such a very generalized understanding of hair. But then there's so many cases that don't fit that scale, that seemingly obvious scale that, oh, if you're better at hair, you charge more and you get opportunities. And, and when you're really good at hair, you get educational opportunities and you get to go speak at this thing and demo at that thing and this company sponsors you and we a lot of us kind of have this idea that oh if i just get better at cutting hair eventually i'll get to this end of the scale and everything will start working in my favor but you can look at you know how how often is it that we see somebody who's like big on instagram or somebody who's doing very expensive haircuts and we go oh my gosh they're not even that good somebody cheated they're they're cheating the system right because we think this is the system but this is not the system. This is just our limited understanding that the day we go into cosmetology school, we think like, oh, well, when I'm really good at cutting hair, all this stuff comes to me, but it doesn't work that way, as we're about to find out. So, scrap that. It doesn't matter how good you are at cutting hair. You only have to be good enough, thank goodness, because that's all I am is good enough. So what I wanna break down here is different kinds of clients that we have. And as I'm describing these, I want you to think about your own clientele because I guarantee you're gonna go, oh my gosh, I have those clients and oh, I have those clients. And, and if we can understand the different kinds of clients and what their needs are, then we can also understand what kind of barber or hairstylist we are and what our needs are. And by understanding these two things and working toward having more of the clients we like, that's how you have a career that you love. Like see, for me, my definition of success is never having to do a haircut that drains you, never having to do a haircut that you're not excited to do. Every time I do a haircut, I'm excited to do it. And to me, that's success. And the money, that'll just, that'll come. But you know, there's some people who are successful, they love what they do at $15 a haircut. And there's some people who are successful at $150 a haircut. And so I think like the price of the haircut isn't necessarily like a, a gauge for success, but how much you love your job, that, that to me is success. But anyways, understanding all of this will help you to understand and navigate there. So what I'm gonna do here is work off of kind of a rip off of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you're unfamiliar, um, this was a theory put out by Abraham Maslow in the 1940s, where he talked about human needs 
and essentially he represents it on a pyramid where at the base of the pyramid you have your most basic needs as a human being to live and then once those basic needs are met you start striving to meet more complicated and and less basic needs and so on the bottom of his pyramid he would have like um, kind of biological needs the sense of just being healthy like you want to make sure your arm isn't rotting off and gangrenous or you want to make sure you don't have the covid you know these basic needs like i'm healthy okay cool i'm, I'm alive i can breathe i can see like I'm, I'm doing okay so bio that's our basic need there and then the next need that he talks about is a sense of security and that's making sure that these walls aren't going to fall in on me making sure that when i go home i'll have like food available to me i have like security so we'll put that here and once your needs for security are met, then you want to strive for a sense of belonging. You want to be a part of a group. Like, I'm Andrew, but I'm also, I'm an American, and I'm a hairdresser, and I'm, I belong to something bigger than me. And so once that need is met, then you have a need for a sense of self. That's like, I'm an American, I'm a hairdresser, but I'm Andrew. I'm me. I'm a unique individual. So that's kind of a... I left one thing off of there on the top. He has self-actualization. That's like a whole other discussion, whatever. But this is just a very basic generalized thing. So in, in terms of marketing, like I've read a lot of marketing books that make reference to this theory here. And uh, essentially, you know, good products know which part of these needs for you they're meeting. You know, if you just need to put any old shoes on your feet, that's like a biological need to like just not have holes in your feet and so you'll go by the cheapest, easiest, fastest shoes possible. But if you want shoes that tell the whole world that you're an individual, you're going to go buy Yeezys and spend $1,200. And so a pair of shoes can meet different needs on this graph. And so haircutting is exactly the same way. If somebody shows you a picture of a haircut and goes, how much do you think this is worth? Like there, you cannot freaking tell because that haircut could meet different needs for different clients. This biological need client, that's the guy or girl who gets a haircut absolutely bare minimum like whenever they need a haircut because if they don't have a haircut and their hair's hanging in their eyes or over their ears they feel like a dirt ball and so a haircut to them is is like brushing their teeth it's like shining their shoes it's like a chore that they have to do to maintain just like the basic necessities of just being a clean human being like they don't want to look like a hippie this haircut doesn't make them feel cool it doesn't make them feel like an individual it doesn't make them feel like a part of a group it just is basic bare minimum now a client like that they're the client, if they walk into your shop and they go, hey, do you have an opening for a haircut right now? And you go, hey man, I'm finishing this one up, but if you come back in 15 minutes, I got you. And they go, yeah, yeah, cool. And then they leave and they don't come back. What they do is they go down the street to the next shop and they go, hey, do you have a haircut available? And they go, yeah, get in the chair. And that's where they get their haircut. The same client, he goes, hey, do you got a haircut available? And you're like, yeah. Oh, and then they go, okay, well, how much is it? And you go, it's 25 bucks. And they go, oh, okay, cool. I'm just going to go to my car and get my wallet. I'll be right back. And then they leave and they don't come back. We've had this happen before, right? And then what he actually does is he goes down the street and he goes, hey, how much is a haircut? And they go, 15 bucks. And he goes, all right, cool. And climbs up in the chair. So this client's not willing to spend a ton of money on his hair. It's hard to write in this scenario here. He'll maybe spend 15, 20 bucks on a haircut because all it means to him is the bare minimum. It's like shining his shoes. It's like doing his laundry. Now, let me explain that. When you buy a brand new shirt, brand new pair of pants or whatever, you feel cool like this. Oh, this new shirt says something about me. It says like, look at how cool and stylish it is, right? But when you take that shirt and you launder it, it doesn't say anything new about you. You're just upkeeping the bare minimum stuff that you already had. And so this client getting a haircut is like doing his laundry. So I'm going to nickname him the laundry client. This guy, he wants the path of least resistance. He wants to go to the shop that's quickest, most easily available. He does not want to be in there a long time. He doesn't want a styling lesson. He doesn't want to buy product. He just needs a basic haircut, quick, easy, and cheap. So the next client whose haircut means a sense of security to him, this is the client who wants to come back every other Friday and he wants the exact same haircut every time. And as soon as he realizes that you can offer this secure routine for him, it, it's worth something to him. And this is the client who halfway through the haircut, if you maybe like, maybe you usually fade from the bottom up, but then one time you fade him from the top down, he'll stop you and go, hey, hey you're doing it different. Like he craves this routine, this security and getting the same haircut every other week. In, in between his getting his car washed and his going to Starbucks routine that he does every other Friday. These clients are actually willing to spend a little bit more than the last guy, as long as you can offer them that routine. And so the first guy, 
even if you're offering this sense of a secure routine to him, it goes right over him. It goes right over his head. He doesn't care about that because it's not, it, his haircut doesn't make him feel secure in any kind of routines. But this other guy, he's looking for this routineness and he wants to come in and get the same greeting every time and have the same freaking routine. He's the guy where if you have to take a vacation or you get jury duty or you get sick and you have to move him, he's a little bit irritated about it. And he goes, oh, but I booked this appointment months ago. I, I book every other week for months out. Why do you have to move me? Like this is the client who, if you mess up his routine in any kind of way, he's pissed. But if you can keep his routine, he's willing to spend a little bit more than the bare minimum client. So I'm gonna nickname this client the usual. Because he walks in, he says, give me the usual. Don't deviate, please, thank you. Here's your exact same tip that you get every time, whether you do a great job or an average job. So the next client, he has a need for a sense of belonging. And his haircut makes him feel like he's a cool kid, like he's a part of the hip group. He's got what's going on and what's happening. He's got what all the celebrities are doing and what 19 of his friends are doing. This is a client that comes in and he shows you a picture of a haircut that you've already done 20 times that week. And, uh, and he thinks he's so cool for getting it. And, and he is, he's, he's belonging to a group now. He wants people to look at him and look at his hair and go, oh yeah, yeah, he gets it. He, he's, it's 2020 and he looks about like 2020. He's got this. It gives him a feeling that he's doing the right thing in the sense of other people are doing it and it's safe, but it's still cool but it's not, it, it means a little bit more to him than just a routine. It means a little bit more to him than just a quick in and out haircut. It means, no, I went, I went to the barber shop that all my friends go to. I went to the cool barber shop and I bought the cool product because all my friends were using that product too. And it's not necessarily a sense of like them being a follower. Um, maybe if you want to word it that way, it could kind of be that, but it's more so their haircut makes them feel cool, but not cool like different. It makes them feel cool like like, okay, cool, I'm not standing out. I'm not doing something so over the top that someone might make fun of me. They're doing something that, that makes them feel accepted. This guy is willing to spend more than the security client, the uh, usual client. He's willing to spend more than the laundry client, but only if you make him feel like he's a part of the cool group. This is the guy who, when he walks into the barber shop, if every barber says, hey, what's up, welcome back, and he feels like, like, oh, this is my people, this is my barber shop, I know everyone here, like they love that, they value that. So I'm gonna nickname this client. Let me, let me preface here. When I came up with this whole theory, um, I, it was before the Me Too movement, like the hashtag thing. And so I, I should change this. I should take a minute to come up with a better term. But this is the client who says, hey, everyone got this haircut, Me Too. I want that haircut too. And uh, I, I mean not to make light of the Me Too hashtag and movement and all that, but for lack of a better term, I mean, I tried for about 30 seconds to think of something better. Maybe I should have tried for another 30. Anyways, we all know we've had these clients, right? Um, a lot of times their friends will come in and, and they'll ask for something and then when they come in, they, they'll even say like, look, don't tell John that I want the same haircut that he got, but pretty much give me John's haircut. This client is willing to listen to styling lessons. He's willing to take product recommendations as long as it'll make him feel cool, as long as it'll make him feel like he's got that hair that everyone's supposed to have right now. The security client, he'll take some a little bit of styling lessons and a little bit of product recommendations as long as it like he wants a product that's gonna work the same every time. And if, it, if, if one day the hold isn't right, he's never buying that product again. Okay, so finally on the top of the pyramid here, we have clients who have a need for a sense of self. So this guy is actually the exact opposite of the last client. This guy comes in and he says, I want a unique haircut that nobody has. Don't give me that crap that everybody has. I want, I want it tailored to me. So this client, his hair tells him and tells the world around him that he's a free thinker that he doesn't need to follow the trends. And he has very specific, heavy, deep needs for his hair. Like this guy's not following the trends at all. The, the bio client, the laundry client, he's not following trends, but not, not for the purpose of being an individual. He's doing it for the purpose of, he doesn't even understand the trends. He just wants something simple. But this self client, he's probably aware of the trends, but he goes, yeah, I don't care. I still want this other cool thing. I saw a haircut in a movie that people haven't watched or talked about in a few years, and it stood out and I liked it. And I want that haircut. It's different. So this client, I'm gonna call a one-off. Because this one-off client, what he values is the feeling, if you can give him the feeling that his haircut is custom tailored, one of a kind, nobody else has this haircut, this is made for your head. You know, this client, if you pull out a number two guard and just do the side with a number two, he feels like, yo, you just did a number two. That's like, I could get that at the barber shop. But if you get out scissors and you give him a scissor fade, he goes, hmm. Nobody, no, none of my friends have scissor fades. Like they care about this um, velvet rope mentality. 
they are willing to spend, because I do clients like this, oh my gosh, learn to write, Andrew. These guys are willing to spend $100 and up as long as you make them feel like a cool, unique individual. And so thinking about these different clients, like this, this laundry client, he wants to go to the salon or barbershop that's right next door to Starbucks, that's not out of his way, that's easy to find. But this one-off client, if he has to like go knock on a back door in an alleyway, and get a secret code to get into the salon, he loves that. Like that makes him feel extra cool. So I, I worked in a salon for years that was right next to a grocery store and a pizza place and a laundromat and just kind of in a little strip mall. And near the end of working in that salon as I was kind of outgrowing it for lack of a better term, I, I would get a lot of new clients who were like shocked. They're like, wow, you're just like next to a grocery store? Like they thought I was gonna be in some cool studio somewhere or something. And at the time I didn't really understand what the deal was, but now that I've kind of worked through all this and understood it, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Because later on I went to go work with uh, my friend Julius, Julius Caesar on Instagram. And he was working in a loft on the 14th floor of a cool old building in downtown LA. And when you made an appointment there, that morning I would text you directions to get to the building. You had to meet with a security guard, give them your name. Your name was on the list. Security guard would walk you to the elevator. And then it was an unmarked door on the 14th floor. And it was like, and that made them feel freaking cool when they went to get their haircut. And you know, to some people you're listening to all this and going, this is silly. It should just be about how good the haircut is, but no, it is not. So imagining this laundry client, if there was a sign at the bottom of that building and it said haircuts up there, and he tried to get in and the security guard goes, hang on, your name has to be on the list. And then his name maybe isn't on the list, but he's like, oh, I'm just trying to get the haircut. And he has to deal with talking to the security guard. Security guard goes, okay, fine, go up the elevator, go down the hall. Like, they don't want to go through all that to get their quick, easy trim. It turns them off. And then when they get up there and they find out it's $100 haircuts up there, they're like, what the heck? No haircut is worth $100. It turns them off. It's exactly what they don't want in a haircut. But at the same time, if this one-off client went to a strip mall next to Starbucks and they walked into a place that was charging $15 and they had, and you didn't even need an appointment, they just had openings right then and there, they would never get their haircut there. They would go, oh no, so they, I'm gonna get a bad haircut there. Even if they're not, even if they're actually going to get a great haircut, but it doesn't make them feel cool because they didn't have to make an appointment, they didn't have to go down the secret corridor, they didn't have to knock, they're not spending an arm and a leg on their haircut, and so it's not a cool haircut, if all of this makes sense. So what I urge you to do, barbers and stylists, is Think about your clients and think about the things that they kind of want and expect from you. And you will start finding that all of your clients have more or less different expectations and they will fall into these categories more or less. There's probably gray areas in between, but you can imagine if you get a client who wants to double check every hair and make sure it's just right, you probably have a security client who's like, no, I need to make sure I get the exact same haircut every time. If you come in, or if you get a client that comes in and every time he comes in, he goes, oh, here's a different picture of a weird mullet. Like, give me this weird mullet but you work in a shop that does pretty straightforward haircuts and every time you do this weird mullet, you're like, dude, this is driving me crazy. But you got a client who wants a weird one-off haircut and you're like, that's not the work I like to do. Um, and, or on the flip side, like I love doing the weird mullets, but when I get a client that comes in and goes, oh, can, can you get this done in 20 minutes? I have to be somewhere. And then when I go to blow dry it, they go, oh, I don't want to blow dry my hair. Like I, even if it will make it better, I just want quick, easy hair. That's draining for me. Like if I had to do 30 haircuts a day that were, you know, 10, 15 minute buzz cuts, I would go crazy, I would lose my mind. But I know people who thrive doing that kind of work because they love the pace of it and they love you know, the kind of light, easy work that it is to where if they get a client who's like, can you show me exactly how to use the blow dryer for my weird one-off mullet? And then that, that stylist or barber is like, oh my gosh, this is exhausting. So figure out what kind of clients you have and then figure out how you feel after each client. Do they drain you? Do they energize you? And then you wanna start gearing your service and start thinking about the little things you do to try to appeal to that client. If you like doing straightforward, regular haircuts routinely and consistently, and you like doing the very mechanical, regular haircuts, try to get more security clients in there. And the way you do that is you just push them to pre-book. And every time you get a client that you sense wants that, you go, hey, do you wanna pre-book your next five appointments? And they will love that. And, and the people who are into that will love you for that. And they'll be like thrilled, like, oh my gosh, I could pre-book five appointments? Yes, let's do that. And the clients who maybe aren't craving that security, they'll go, no, I don't know my schedule that far out. Like, oh, I just, I just wanna walk in when it's convenient. And you're gonna to start to weed out some of these clients because you'll be too booked having the security clients to have walk-ins come in and want the bare minimum. Or likewise, if you want more of these one-off weird clients who want these unusual haircuts, start making time on the side to, to get free models in to do those weird haircuts and post them on Instagram to try to attract people who want weird haircuts. You have to essentially stop doing things that appeal to the cheaper clients. For example, if I get a client who says, oh, you don't have to blow dry my hair, do you know what I do? 
I blow dry their hair. I blow dry everybody's hair. Everybody gets the fullest style in my chair. I don't care if you're in a hurry. If you're in a hurry, don't come to my chair. We're doing the best of my work or no work. And you know what that does? It scares off people who want a quick haircut. Just like the higher price scares off people who want a quick haircut. But at the same time, if you have a cheap price and you, and you absolutely refuse to blow dry hair, because I'll say this, if I was in a scenario where I had to do $15 haircuts all day, I would straight up say no to a blow dry. Because at that rate, for me to be profitable, I don't have time to blow dry hair. So if you absolutely refuse to blow dry hair, you're not gonna get a lot of these clients who want that stylized hair. If somebody goes, hey, I want a weird mullet, and you go, hey, we just don't do weird mullets, it's as simple as that. So if these clients drain you, Find ways to not have them in the chair. Don't offer a blow dry if you don't want to blow dry hair. But if you do want to, if you work in a shop like this and you want to start getting more clients who like this kind of work, start blow drying hair. Start offering advice and, and, and recommending more unique kind of hairstyles and things. So referring back to that first graph that I drew, the, you know, decent haircuts, best haircuts, opportunities are up here. It doesn't work that way. It's not that this haircut is technically better than this haircut. Now, I will say that being more technically proficient and ha having some proficiency in your technical abilities, okay, redundant, will give you more ability to do one-off unique haircuts to where if you know how to do one haircut really, really well, you can thrive in these areas easily. But so in, in that sense, getting better at cutting hair will help you to work on the higher end there. But it's not that you're guaranteed to end up there. If you don't make the other changes involved to try to appeal to the clients who have those needs. It's all about the needs that you're meeting for the clients. And so your technical skill is just a tool that you use to meet the needs of these different clients. And you gotta start paying attention. Get your finger on the pulse of your clientele. What needs does, does this client have? What needs does this client have? And how do I feel about that? Okay, I'm repeating myself. So I'm gonna draw another graph here. So this is um, kind of a, a theory that a lot of marketing books and things talk about. I learned about this from Simon Sinek in um, his book, Start With Why. The laws of diffusion of innovation is essentially how trends and ideas and really like any of the things we do kind of spread throughout the community. Um, and so I'll, I'm talking obviously here in terms of haircut trends. And so on this graph, you'll see that in the middle, you have a lot of people. On the edges, you have very little people. And so this first, um, there's actually another smaller section here for 2.5% of the population are innovators. Then the next 13.5% are the early adopters. I haven't written like manually with an analog writing device in so long. <laughs> I'm surprised I remember how to do it. Anyway, so after that is 34% and another 34%. And this is the the late majority. And then way down here at the end, the last 16% of the population, these are laggards. The innovators, exactly as it sounds. They'll look at a haircut that nobody's had before. They're innovating. They're they're doing something that is not trendy. Um, as you can see, 2.5% of the population. This is the guy that you see at a venue somewhere and he doesn't look like everyone else. He's standing off in the corner and he looks freaking cool. So these types, they're willing to do things before they see someone else try them first. They're willing to, what, what they're doing is they're listening to their own personal needs for their hair or for their whatever they're wearing. Like example, in the, back in the 1940s, 50s, whatever, um, punk kids would ride motorcycles because it was cheaper than cars and they were poor. And when you're riding a motorcycle, it's nice to not have the wind cutting through your clothes and it's nice to not lose your skin when you fall. So they started wearing leather jackets because it served a utility. And that innovated what is fashion now. Now we wear a leather jacket because it's cool. So those guys that were first wearing leather jackets that made them cool, they were doing it for a purpose. And so these innovators, when they want a, a different haircut that nobody's had, it's for a purpose that, that is personal and unique to themselves. They're really good at listening to who they are and what they want. And they don't care what David Beckham did. They're like, I'm me and I want a haircut that speaks for me. So the early adopters are the, um, the, the people who see him and go, wow, I saw this really cool looking guy. I haven't seen this haircut a lot, but I've seen it a few times. I want this haircut. And then the early majority, that's like when something is just 
about to get played out and it's starting to blow up and, and it's still fun for you to do because you haven't been doing them for years, but you know, for the last six months you've been doing this haircut a little more lately and you're, you're kind of liking it and it's starting to become a majority thing. So the late majority, they're just on the other side of the hump. Now it's like been played out and this, this innovator is on something way different already. And uh, the early majority is even starting to get sick of it. But like the late majority is like, hey dude, like they're the guys that come in today like, hey, I, I think I kind of want like a pompadour, like, you know, like a real 50s looking haircut. It's like, bro, in 2014, that was like here. And uh, today that is, it's moving on to the end of the graph. And then the laggards, these are the guys that still come in and they go, I think I want like a faux hawk with a rat tail, like it's 2007 still. So we have these kind of clients too. We, we notice some of them want to pick their haircut based off of their own needs and their own feelings and their own opinions of themselves. And other people want haircuts based on what other people are doing. And uh, if you pay attention to the requests of your clients, you can definitely get a handle on that. So now I turned this paper sideways here because I had more room to draw on that side, but there's another secret hidden reason here. And as far as I know, I haven't seen anybody marry these two graphs together in the way that I'm about to. And so hopefully I can get credit for noticing this first, but um, you will notice that these clients with, who want a one-off haircut for their sense of self, they tend to be the innovators and early adopters. These clients who want a sense of belonging, they tend to be the early majority. And these clients who want a sense of security tend to fall more into the late majority. And then the, bi the clients with the biological need, they, you know, they got to cut their hair like they got to shine their shoes and brush their teeth. They're laggards. They're so far behind on the trends, they don't even freaking care. Uh, so I realized that these two graphs actually fit together beautifully in that way. And uh, that really opened up my understanding of like what I'm doing behind the chair. I'm not just trying to do a better haircut. I'm trying to get people who think this way to feel this way off of their haircut. And when you can do that successfully, you will be freaking booked. If you're completely unaware of all of it, you could have a whole mixed clientele to where you have some people who, you know, they want that haircut that's been cool and it's not very cool anymore. And you get some clients that just want a quick, easy, cheap haircut and they got to complain anytime that they need to wait or anytime the price goes up. And so like when you have this mixed bag of clients, you'll find that you have highs and lows throughout your day. And you'll find that when you get this guy, you're thrilled because that's the kind of haircuts you like to do. And so ultimately, end of the day, you got to understand all this stuff. You got to keep your finger on the pulse of what your clients are like and what you're like. And if, if you can like bank this, I feel like your understanding of what we're doing behind the chair of what we're doing with our haircuts is just so much more streamlined to kind of control where we want to go with it. Do you want to be a higher end service? You have to make people feel like they're getting these higher end needs met through their haircut. Do you want to do simpler, easier, lighter work? Because I've known people who worked in high end salons and then opted to move to cheaper salons because they don't want to sit there and deal with these like needy clients who have really high expectations and, and lots of deep needs for their haircuts. And so uh, I was thinking about this recently even, and because uh, I, haven't, I haven't actually thought this through in probably a year, but uh, I realized too, like some of the looks that we see from the, these clients, like the early adopters and the innovators, like I, have, I feel like there's like a subconscious, um, appearance of they have it all figured out. Like they, they, they've got this need met, they've got this need met, they've got this need met. And by doing some kind of cool, innovative hairstyle, it like tells the world around them that, oh, that guy's got it all figured out. And I think, you know, whether they do or not, I think, uh, you know, haircuts definitely tell a story about whoever's wearing them, whether they intend it to or not. And uh, you could go in and get a perfectly clean, crisp, straight, by the book haircut. And the only story it tells is that you've got a basic haircut a really good basic haircut, maybe the best in its class, but it doesn't tell the world that, hey, you're doing this cool, innovative, different thing. So I've known guys who own barbershops that are like super booked and super packed, and they're doing a whole bunch of these kind of clients, and they're frustrated that they're not like one of the cool kids doing cool hair. And I'm like, you're doing a different kind of hair, you know? Um, you could be the best in the world at what you do, and whether or not you're successful, that comes down to how much you enjoy your work. Because I know people who do $15 haircuts and make more money than I do doing $100 haircuts. And so like money in the bank isn't necessarily a great indicator alone for, for how successful you are in hair. But knowing who you are and offering something tailored for a very specific client, that's where you will find success because you will find yourself doing the work you love to do and not doing the work you don't love to do. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you'd like to, more of this kind of information, check out thehairjam.com. This is one of like 15 videos that I have like this at thehairjam.com. And so uh, we should have enrollment open sometime 
in the next year or something. I don't know. We've, because of COVID, we kind of like stopped pushing there. But anyways, yeah, if you like this, this is the kind of stuff that we have at thehairjam.com. Thanks for watching.